I want you to imagine that you're in a very busy place, a bit like I'm standing here now, and you're in a big city and you see a homeless person. I want to suggest there are four things that you can do. The first thing is to decide that homelessness is a terrible problem in the big city in which you're standing uh, and to go away and form an organisation that will deal with homelessness, perhaps remove homelessness altogether, form a board of people uh, like yourself who are determined to do something about it. Then the second option that you have is to get a whole large group of people together to work on the issue, including homeless people themselves, but also local businesses, the local authority, uh, and other charities, perhaps other churches, to work with you. And the third option you have is actually to go up to the homeless person, maybe to buy them uh, a cup of coffee, and to sit down, uh, discuss the local football results, uh, the local plans for the Olympics, or whatever is on any, everybody else's mind. And the fourth option you have is to go away and to go home back to your apartment or back to your house and to blog about homelessness and say that too many people use the wrong language uh, about homeless people. Uh, they shouldn't refer to the homeless, they should refer to people as individuals with their own stories. And I want to suggest there's a name for each of these four approaches. The approaches where you see the problem of homelessness and go away and set up an organisation. That's what I call working for. The second I would call working with. You've brought together a, a body of all different kinds of people, including the homeless person themselves uh, and local businesses and so on. That's what I'd call working with. It's a little bit like community organising. And the third approach, where you sit down and have a cup of coffee and discuss the Premier League in England or the the league in uh, uh, the football games in Amsterdam, that's called being with because there's no working going on. You're simply enjoying being, uh, sharing the company and the conversation of another person. And then the last approach where you go home and you write your blog and you tell everybody else that they use the wrong language about homelessness, uh, that's, called be that's called being for. Now I want to look a little bit more closely about where these uh, four different approaches have things in common and where they differ. The two that end with four, working for uh, and being for, what they have in common is that you never actually need to talk to or meet an individual homeless person at all. What they have in common is that you think you already know the answer uh, and you understand the homeless person only by what they haven't got, a home. They haven't got a home, you've got lots of intelligence and ideas and networks and friends, and you can fix it. In the case of working for, you fix it actively uh, by creating an organisation that solves problems. In the case of being for, you fix it verbally by making sure the whole of society uh, talks and therefore thinks the way you do. Being with is the only approach that puts the homeless person at the centre of the story and doesn't assume that that person is a problem that either I or they need to fix. It looks into the mystery of the reality of that person's life and cherishes that person's life for its assets, for what, what is good about it, where the skills are, where the flourishing life is, and doesn't start with its deficits, the fact that it simply that person simply doesn't have a home. Now I'd like you to think with me for a few moments about the shape of Jesus' life using the four categories that I've already been in introducing. In fact, we only really need three of them. Jesus spent one week in Jerusalem working for us, achieving our salvation, dying for our sins. He spent three years in Galilee working with us, building a social movement like a community organiser, empowering and training and teaching the disciples. And he spent 30 years in Nazareth, simply being with the people of Nazareth, being with us as human beings, sharing the life of a carpenter's shop, 
hanging out in the local coffee shops or whatever passed for coffee shops in first century Nazareth. Think about the percentages involved in those three kinds of interaction. Jesus spent 1% of his life among us, his incarnate life among us, working for. He spent 9%, three years, of his life among us, working with us. And he spent 90%, 90% of his incarnate life among us, being with us. Now we may say, well, of course, God is different to us. God had never done an incarnation before and God had no idea how to do an incarnation. So obviously it's understandable that God got the percentages wrong. But we, we know all about incarnation and we all know all about salvation. And so we, uh, we allow ourselves to change the percentages and say we're going to spend 90% of our energies on working for and we're going to reverse them and spend hardly any of our energy on actually being with. I want first of all to point out the arrogance of assuming we know better than God how to do an incarnation. But I also want to challenge you to imagine how are we going to spend eternity with God and with one another. I want to challenge you to think about eternity, about eternal life. Why as Christians do we want people to be saved? I guess because we want to prevent them going to the burning fires or to oblivion or whatever the fashionable language for downstairs happens to be. We want them to go upstairs. We want them to go to heaven. But what is that heaven? Is that heaven being preserved forever alone? Being preserved for he forever alone doesn't sound like heaven to me. It sounds more like hell. What's vital about heaven is not still being, it's being with. Heaven is being with God, being with one another, being with ourselves, and being with the renewed crea creation forever. It's the with that counts, not just the continued being. Let me explain the journey another way. When you get to know somebody, perhaps you get to really like them, you say, you should come over, you should come over to my place. Uh, let me cook you a meal. And so the first time they say yes, you come home from work early, you work really hard, you make everything look perfect, and you put a beautiful meal on the table for them. And they're really impressed because they know you work full time and you manage to produce this beautiful meal. You must be very, very talented. The second time, if that's gone really well, you say, well, why don't you come over a little bit earlier, straight after the wor work, and we'll cook the meal together. The third time, if that's gone really well, you say, why don't you just come over? We don't really know, need to worry about the meal. We just enjoy spending time together. The first one is working for, I cook the meal for you, lots of effort by me. The second one is working with, we cook the meal together. But when things are really going perfectly, it's not about the food, it's about the being together and just hanging out together. And then transfer that to a ministry, shall we say, in a soup kitchen uh, for disadvantaged people who experience food poverty. You start by saying, they're hungry, we've got food, we're going to cook lots of lasagnas or whatever it is, and we're going to give them lots of things to eat. That's working for. But it's very unsatisfying because the truth is, for almost all homeless people, the real problem in their life isn't shortage of food. Then you say, what we're really trying to do is to train people up so the users of the service, the people who originally came just to eat, end up in the kitchen so they get to, to work with us. That's a move from working for to working with. But the truth is, the whole point of having a soup kitchen is so that people sit down and eat together. It's the conversation and the fellowship that happens that is the whole point of the thing. All the time you spend in the kitchen cooking the food is just preparation. And it, the whole experience is wasted if you never come out and sit down together. So if your ministry is going to be truly incarnational and your mission is going to be truly incarnational, it needs to have the same shape as Jesus' life. It needs to be 90% being with, not just as a means to get to fixing things, but to recognize that all of our life 
uh, as citizens of heaven, is preparing to be with God and with one another forever. So we, our job as Christians is to imitate the life of heaven, and the way we do that is the way we go about being with one another. This means we need to review all of our mission and not assess the things that we do for people, the way we try to fix other people's lives or the solutions that we try to find, but to focus on whether we are generating the right kind of contexts in which real human connection can be made. Here's the paradox and perhaps the tragedy of so much of Christian mission. We're trying to solve the wrong problem. We get it into our heads that the human predicament is about limitation, that we die, that we get sick, that we have disabilities, that we're short of food and so on. The human problem is not limitation. The human problem is isolation, isolation from one another and from God. If the human problem were limitation, then the solution would be in the laboratory, would be in further research, would be in expensive new technologies. But the tragic irony is that so much investment in solving the wrong problem only exacerbates the real problem. The wrong problem is limitation. Trying to solve the problem of limitation through more technology uh, and more time in the laboratory only exacerbates the real problem, which is human isolation. We become fantastic at be being able to talk to people in Australia, but we lose the art of communicating with our next door neighbour. That encapsulates the problem. We, we, we think we want to solve all the world's problems by working for, we miss the fact that the answer to life, the universe and everything is being with. Because imagine in heaven, there will be no problems to fix. There will be no point in working with and working for. It will be all being with. And mission is about imitating the life of heaven now, being with God. That's what ministry is about. That's what mission's about. That's what discipleship is about. And in the end, that's what forever will be about.